Marinero, the sick podcast on this Tuesday afternoon. A lot to talk about for CF Montreal because the season is around the corner. As a matter of fact, it opens up Saturday night in Orlando versus Orlando City. CF Montreal played their last preparation game on the weekend. A 4-1 loss to the Tampa Bay Rowdies. A lot of people didn't expect that, but at the end of the day, it is preseason. Tickets go on sale for CF Montreal's game versus Inter-Miami which will be played here in Montreal on May 11th. They'll go on sale in a couple of days, and already we're getting word of what the ticket prices will be. We'll discuss. Captain, co-captain, how does that work exactly? Coach candidates for the Canadians men's national team, and when the MLS opens up their season on the weekend, on Saturday, will they have MLS referees? Yes or no? We discuss all of this and more. Joining me today, Montreal Impact. Captain, former Montreal Impact player, of course, Patrice Bernier. He's coming up. He and I, the Sick Podcast, CF Montreal Talk. Turn up your volume. Because you're about to listen to the Sick Podcast. CF Montreal Talk. Here's the chance. Here's the chance. They've got the goal. Absolutely incredible. Cameron Porter delivers the goal. The sickest CF Montreal podcast. It's going to be sick. Sick, sick, sick. And the sick podcast brought to you in part by Energy Transportation Group, recently named by Deloitte and CIBC as one of Canada's best managed companies. The country's leading business award, recognizing innovative and world class companies, the best managed Canadian companies. Designation fuels energy's purpose of creating progress for their customers, their employees, and their communities. Join a winning team and check out Energy's career page for available opportunities. Also brought to you in part by Playground, over 30,000 square feet of new gaming, dining, and entertainment space. It's time to reacquaint yourself with Playground. World-class sushi, AAA stakes, live shows, a brand new poker floor, and so much more. Located just over the Mercy Bridge, only minutes from downtown Montreal. Playground, playground experience the strip without the trip. And also brought to you in part by Inofspar. J'ai décidé de collaborer avec Inofspar, une compagnie d'ici, afin de dynamiser l'apprentissage et la pratique du sport pour tous et partout. Les différents produits permettent de rester actif tout en développant sa confiance son autonomie et sa technique. Des produits efficaces, progressifs et personnalisés avec le logo de votre école. In of Sport, pour tous et partout. And joining me today is Patrice Bernier. Hello, Pat. Hey, how's it going, Tony? Uh, it's going very well. Ali is not with us today. He will be back next week. And I have good news, by the way, for those who thought that Ali sounded, made a lot of sense last week, but unfortunately sounded like he was talking out of a metal can. We have something for Ali. So we're going to set him up so he's going to sound really good. Ali will be with us next week. Pat, there's a lot to talk about. Uh, let's start with, unfortunately, there's not a lot of footage out there, but a 4-1 loss versus the Tampa Bay Rowdies. So I'll I'll start with this. A buddy of mine calls me a couple of days ago, says they lost to a USL team. Is this a joke? I said, it's preseason. I don't put much into it. He said, I do. The season starts in one week. Is he right or am I right or are we both right? As a guy who played, how much stock did you guys put into games versus an inferior opposition in the preseason? I would say not too much stock. Like, I would not be worried for the season, but I am worried a bit about the defense or certain things that are happening more often because it's not just the 4-1. They took 13 goals in four games. That's three goals a game. So now, from what I heard, the game was very muddy. It was raining. The conditions weren't great. Not that excuses, but those are things that we don't see. And it seems like a lot came from the same mistakes we saw against Atlanta. Back, the back trying to make plays that necessarily they have to maybe uh, maybe naive decision-making. Uh, so I think they have time to, re to rectify that. But still, 
it's saying that you still took four goals against a lower team. No matter if it was a lower team, you still took four goals. And you took, let's not remember, 6-2 uh, via, uh, it's a, if I'm Colorado. So worrisome for the season? No, but still worried about certain things that they need to tweak because they're taking a lot of goals. And I don't think that's good for the mindset heading to the season. Pat, the back line, the defenders that they have, are they good enough to play with a back three formation? Now, when I talk formation, yes, there's three center backs, but you know, you can say it's five because you got wing backs all depending on what animation you give or don't give your team. But are how much confidence would you have in a three-man center back of let's just say Souza? Corbo Waterman. I'd be confident. Uh, the only thing is, like we saw the, the the game in Atlanta. At least most people that got to see it from the YouTube, uh, they're gonna play seems like very high line. So now, are we fast enough in Montreal for certain of these aspects of these teams that have pacey forwards or wingers or even wing backs? That's the question. And two, let's not forget, Rudy Camacho was the main guy at the back the last few years. Now Waterman will have a full season of being the boss. And how will he manage that with the ball and that back line? So it'll be interesting to see how they press the ball as a defensive unit and how do they manage depth. Because if I look, like we only saw a glimpse and images of the Colorado game, but it seemed like it was either mistakes from the back or Balls being played in behind and guys going on goal almost freely. So I'm confident that they can work it out, but they're really going to – Waterman and those guys are really going to have to talk to really read the play really well because if they're going to yeah. play a bit more like Wilfred Nasi, meaning having the ball and going forward a lot more, that means there's going to be space in the back and they're really going to have to work at that. Uh, and if Campbell is usually the fastest guy on that team is not a starter, how are they going to adjust – to uh, the pace that some of these guys have up front in MLS. So I like Sosa a lot, but we saw in preseason, speed is a challenge for him when it's coming at him. Waterman got beat last year often with a lot of balls over the top. And I think if they play high line, they're not fast enough to play high line. And I don't think they're experienced enough to play high line. Waterman is a good center back. He's not the best center back in the league. And he's a downgrade with all due respect to him, to Rudy Camacho, who had a lot of experience. Sosa comes in. He's brand new. There's going to be chemistry issues there. There's going to be communication, you would think. He and Corbo will communicate well. I mean, they both, you know, Came out of Italy. That's fine. You have wing backs who are brand new. Ruan will be one. Uh, Edwards will be the other. They're going to come into a new system. Yeah, when the other ones are probably playing okay. I don't think they can play high line. Yeah, it's like you just mentioned. You know how many players are new? Like if you take this Corbo Waterman, but then after that, yeah. Ruan, Edwards... That's also chemistry, having to work with people, talking. And Waterman, as much as uh, he mentioned, he preferred playing on the right out of three, but the, they saw, felt they were comfortable having him in the middle of the three. I saw Corbo when he came, when he arrived. He was in the middle of the three. That's one guy I would have been interested to see being in the middle of those three because I feel he reads the game quite well. Maybe it's the Italian uh, uh, defensive uh, units knowing to learn how to anticip anticipate in front and in the back. But like you said, I'm curious because what we saw from Atlanta game is they did move high, but they're really going to have to read those play or Ruan, who's probably the fastest guy on that team, or at least at the back, who is going to have to do a lot of job to cover some of these players if Campbell yeah. is not in the three. I like those guys in terms of when we have the ball, but this is a league of fast transition, and you mentioned it. I'm not so confident in terms of their pace, so they're really going to have to read the play. They're going to have to count on reading the yeah. play. That's the aspect that 
we don't know yet if Waterman can be the guy in the middle that's able to put the water on the fire when it happens, when the, the other teams break out quickly on them. So I like Corbo as the center back, the guy in the middle. I do. The challenge is, is that I find when they put Waterman at right center back, there's a dip. Waterman's more comfortable in the middle, I find, than he is on the right. Even though I like Corbo in the middle, the drop-off from Waterman from right to center back, I think you have to put Waterman in the middle to start. Corbo on the right, Souza on the left. But it's going to be interesting to see, like you said, if Campbell's the fastest one when he's not in the lineup. And what's it going to look like when they go to their bench? All right, okay. Uh, they open up their season Saturday in Orlando. Uh, tickets will go on sale, by the way, in the next couple of days, individual tickets versus Inter-Miami. Now, it should be known that, of course, if you're a season ticket holder, you already have access to the Inter-Miami game. After they sold season ticket packages, and I believe they sold 15,000 season tickets, two of which belong to me, by the way, um, I have to they also, sold. I have to also. Uh, good. So you know we account for four. Uh, there is also um, they sold a, a six game package, uh, and that Miami game is in that six game package. So after selling out the season tickets and the six game package, there's going to be individual tickets which will go on sale. I saw a post from FC Boreal, which is an amateur club, of course, in Quebec who sent out something to their members saying, hey, look, we were able to procure 50 tickets. We were told the cost is going to be $600, and we're not making a penny off of this. This is what the club, this is what CF Montreal is charging us for the tickets. So $600. But we also were able to get our hands on, uh, someone put this on on social media, which we found. I don't know who it is, by the way, uh, or else if I do, we would give credit, but it was sent to me without whoever put it up there. So let's bring it up. What could be the possible prices for the game? Or and I guess it's somebody who got it off the website, I would imagine, or whatever. But $449 plus tax, all the way up until $1799 plus tax. And uh, $449, that would probably make sense because I was told that the cheapest individual ticket to get into the stadium is about $525 tax included. Patrice, I'd like to get your thoughts on this. Let's be honest. We're not used to these prices in Montreal. Montreal's always been extremely affordable. You can bring a family of four to get in for $100. You know, you probably, it probably cost you more to go watch a movie if you, if you went four people to a movie theater and you probably had some popcorn or whatever. I think it's great value. There are other stadiums, there are other cities, other teams in the league that have put up these individual tickets for sale. They are at an inferior price point than this. Some of them are superior. What are your thoughts on a, some individual tickets available, but it's going to cost no less than $525 tax in to get into the stadium per person? Uh, now I look at it that this is the first time in the history of the club that 15,000 tickets, season tickets are sold out. So there's really yeah. 4,000 tickets left for that game. Or like you said, with the package, probably even less with the game six game package. So I look at it as if we take the Montreal Canadiens, prime time game. If you take Toronto, uh, Boston coming in, those games, the ticket goes up another ratio. And we all know what happened last year when Dylan Messi arrived in the league. So that game will be priced, or the prices for that ticket game will be a bit higher than what you're accustomed to. Because there's not, there's a rarity factor. And the factor that most other clubs probably have uh, even more room. Like if you take Toronto, they have 17 or 16,000 tickets, but they have a 30,000 30, seater. So there's 13,000 tickets that you can play with. So it is expensive. It's what I expected a bit for just one game because we saw what happened last year. Uh, and you know that now if you didn't take your season ticket, that's what most people did to try to get it to a fair bargain price, if you could say. You're going to be stuck with coming to that game and paying full price. I remember, Tony, weren't you the one who put some tickets for Red Bulls last year? 
Yeah. And, and then when Messi, uh, Messi arrived, those tickets went boom. They skyrocketed. So this is going to be a factor I, that there's not that many left. And uh, we'll see once that game arrives because things could change. If you're hearing that Messi might not come, those prices might go down. I think it's still fluctuating. It's not a set price from what I've heard in, in, uh, internally from the club. I bought the tickets center half, fourth row, $96 US. And uh, the week before the game, there were people that were prepared to pay about minimum $1,250 US per ticket for a ticket that was bought at $96 US. Now, uh, I hear you. I think you make a lot of sense what you said. Not all games for the Montreal Canadiens have the same price point. There are premium tickets. I'll tell you what bothers me a little bit. And I understand we can't have it both ways. We cannot ask to see the Lionel Messi's of this world and then not charge accordingly. I get that too, okay? Yeah. I don't even know if there's a solution here. But I'll tell you what. Um, I find a little bit difficult is that we'll take a look at my season tickets. All right. So my season tickets, I, I believe uh, the ticket is what is probably about. Uh, so I got 17 games for about $1,540, which means that The two tickets cost about $90, which means one ticket is $45, all right? Between $45 and $525, that's yeah, a huge uh, jump. That's a, that's a that's huge jump. That's not... I'm going to tell you more one, than, one That's thing more that than I, two times. That's more than three. That's more than 10 times. That's more than 12 times. What is it? It's more than 13. It's just over 13 times. That's a, a, a skyrocket price. Now, I'm going to say something. This is a North American thing. Because if you go look at tickets anywhere else in the world, for, and I'm talking about prime clubs that have pristine players, Man City, yeah. PSG, Bayern Munich. I even went to see uh, Barcelona semifinal Copa del Rey. In Camp Nou, 65 euros. So that's just to show the prices over there are. Wow. Uh, we're now we're skyrocketing because we make it an event in the US and Canada when something happens, NFL, NBA, it becomes an event and suddenly the ticket goes way above what the regular price would necessarily be. And I'm not saying, look, for somebody who wants to go see Leon and Messi who doesn't have season tickets and it's like, hey, you love it to me, I have an opportunity, and you're looking at the price, you go, hmm. But the reality is some people are still going to want to pay that because the yeah, I, I hear you. They're going to steal it. So now, I, I just did the math, by the way. I think it's so it's, a, it's over 11 and a half times the amount that I paid for mine. So this is what I tell you. This is what I tell you in the end. Buy season tickets next year. This is great value. I didn't buy the best tickets. I didn't buy the worst. At 1540 for 17 games, would that game include it? I think it's a great deal. Even though I told my rep, you can't do lower. You can't do lower. You can't do lower. I still think it's a pretty good deal, I have to admit. Hey, but the thing is, we, we like, I'm not going to lie. And you know, people were saying, but hey, Patrice, can you get me tickets 11th of May? I said, get season tickets. That'll be your best bet to get the game and to get it at a fair price. And as a matter of fact, you're, some people probably pay them $600, $700 for the season ticket. And the game, the ticket for the game is going to yeah. cost you to say, so... And then you could probably I, I gave the them. same advice, Patrice. And I gave the neighbors, same advice. My neighbors did it. They paid. And I said, look, this is yeah. the fastest way to make sure you're getting it for a good yeah. price or else you're going to really overpay because we saw what happened last year. Yeah. All the tickets went $300, $400, US dollars. And you said it. Your ticket yeah. bumped up to almost two grand. So this is the yeah. Atlanta Messi effect and the factor that there's less tickets left. I don't know if. The, season, the, the club would have 10,000 season tickets and there would be 10,000 left. Maybe that ticket price wouldn't be as high. Now that there's uh, so much left, so few left, they could put it at the price they want, or at least the price they want, a price that they assume yeah. that people are going to be willing to pay. 
so uh, we were all wondering what will be the cost for the ticket for one for that game. But now that 15,000 tickets, six game packs sold. So there's what, 3,000 tickets left? Maybe. Yeah. Four. So it'll be uh, so that's the price. Uh, but I've been told that the price that you saw, people weren't supposed to see this price. So that means it could fluctuate to being a bit lower. Okay. So look, I'm going to say this. Uh, now we have some people in the YouTube uh, live chat right now who are saying, you know, and how about if he doesn't play? Look, any sporting event you go to anywhere in the world, any team, any sport, there's always a risk that the player that you most want to see or players that you most want to see will not be there. All right. That's that happens everywhere. If I were a betting man, I would say that if healthy, Lionel Messi will play all the games in Miami this season, right? Or at least at least one half, all right? At least the first half of every game, if healthy. Uh, I think they're going to pick their spots on the road. They are involved in some cup games as well. He is involved in some international duty as well. I think they're going to pick their spots on the road. The first games that he wouldn't play, I think would be either on A, synth synthetic grass, and or B, if it happens to be three games in one week, then, you know, they're going to give him a rest. There's a tremendous amount of pressure, I know, on Messi, Inter Miami, by everyone, probably even MLS, to try and have Messi appear in every single game if he's healthy, even for a couple of minutes, because he's the number one reason why people are going to the games in which his team is playing. But anyway... Um, see if Montreal will play them twice. Once on, what is it? I think it's March 10th yeah, in Miami really and May 11th, of course, in Montreal. I have a question to you who was a former captain. And let's bring up a picture here, if we can, of that Samuel Piet, CF Montreal captain on your left. That's Victor Wanyama, who was once upon a time the assistant captain to Samuel Piet. My question to you, Pat, is can you still be a captain of a team if you're not a starter? Uh, yeah. These, this day and age, yes. And I did it. I did it in 2015. I barely played for the whole season. So, But uh, the factor is, which is really interesting, is now most coaches create a group so certain players, you know, their veteran leadership, they're maybe not going to play as much, but you're told and knowing that in CF Montreal, a lot of young players are there. You want them to be prepared for the next step because, you know, you want to hopefully sell them and so that they are able to perform and realize that Victor Wanyama is also at the second part of his two year contract. Uh, we all know that before he actually signed, it didn't look like he was going to sign. So. If he came, is it because, you know, we we saw the opportunities there. We didn't. We were ready to let him go. We signed him at the discount because he was earning $3 million before, and now he's about $1.5 to uh, just between two. Uh, I think you still can be a veteran player uh, with his leadership, or even, who cares, maybe you never know. Samuel Pitt might not be a, a, a starter, definitely. But this, this DNA, you can. That all, that all depends on how the player wants to uh, seize it himself and, and internally deals with it. Meaning that either he's, I'm not part of the project, so I'm just going to come here, do my job, get paid, go home, and wait for it to end. Or if the coach, Laurent Courtois, really said, look, I can't guarantee you the minutes, but I really count on you to be here for this group. You'll have a role. You'll have a project. Uh, I remember John Herman did it with Sam Piet. He was not necessarily a starter, but he was part of the leadership group. So you can still do it. Now it depends on how the player wants. I would see Victor and Wayama, if it happens to him, that he'd be able to uh, to manage it and to be the, the person that he is, not the player yeah. the that he is, to be able to say, I want Nathan Saliba, I can give you some, some, uh, some counseling to be a better midfielder. Or all the other players that are around that team, Sunusi Ibrahim. I know he's very close with the the players with African descent, so uh, it's possible, but it's not that easy. I can tell you that in 2008, so, oh, it was not hard. It was not that easy. I want to I, I want to play the the process of elimination game. Go ahead. Uh, Matthew Schwanier was excellent for this team one year ago, scoring five goals, 
and he was the jack of all trades for the team. Um, in my opinion, he and Sirwa, the two best players for CF Montreal last season, who this year comes into camp and says, I, I want to play in the midfield. All right, because he was used as a 10, as an 8, as a 6, as a 7, as an 11. He was used everywhere last year. This year says, I want to play in the midfield. You take a look at camp, he's in the midfield. Chouanier, their MVP last season, in the midfield, he has to play. He's got unbelievable cardio. Uh, he can run for three days nonstop. He's got a year more under his belt in the league. He's getting better. They need him. He's got to play. Saliba, last year, did not produce. But he played three quarters of the games. They got his feet wet. Yeah. And then they did more than that. And they brought him back down a little bit. And then, boom, it was his. And we all know what happened with Wanyama. I think Wanyama was benched 10 of the last 11 games or didn't start 10 of the last 11 games under Losada. We know that Saliba was a good learning year for him last year. His value went up. And the intention, although it's not set in stone, would be the goal would probably be this guy plays every game or 90% of them, 80% of them. He's able to take the next step, maybe even two steps, and he's sold at the end of the season, right? For that to happen, he has to play. So what am I getting at? I don't think Piet and Wanyama are going to... I think Piet will play more than Wanyama because Piet is still going to be here. Wanyama will be gone at the end of the season. And he's not a player that I don't think they can take and sell. We don't even know if he's going to continue his career after this season. So I don't think Wanyama is going to play a lot. I don't think Piet's going to play more than 45 minutes a game. I think the majority of the time in the midfield is going to go to Schwanier and Saliba, two guys who not only will start, in my opinion, but can play a lot of minutes. So no, that's, that's why I ask you, you know, how effective of a captain can you be to go out there and give that pep talk and rally and, and be the – be the guy on the field to, to, to make, you know, compose everyone when maybe things get out of hand or a little bit emotional, settle things down, go and talk to the referee. You know, how effective can that captain be if he's never starting a game? Uh, that's the factor. And I, I think, like, I'm going to read into the lineup they had the last game because maybe there we don't know. Nathan Saliba maybe have a knock, but they did start Piet and Schwanier. And that's the last game you're playing before you start a the season. They played 60, 70 minutes, meaning normally, having been in the staff, you're pushing the players to the threshold they are able to do, knowing that you got 90 minutes, but they potentially could play 90 minutes, but you don't want to get them injured. They started with Piet and Schwanier, which tells me they're going to play. And what I've read into what he the answers that Piet has been uh, saying a lot is, Laurent Courtois has been telling me I have to talk more. I have to dictate the guys on the field. Telling me they're giving him the leadership on, for, on the field. So even though Nathan is the player we all believe this year, if he breaks out like he and finished last season, could be sold, has the potential to go to the next level. Now that's the big conundrum is – who are you going to put on the bench? Because we know they're going to play with two center midfielders. Schwanier said, I want to play in the midfield. He was MVP. And I said last time, I've never seen an MVP not play the next year. Uh, so, yeah. so right now I see Piet Schwanier starting and Saliba probably coming in or Victor Wanyama. Uh, Pat, if that's the case, there's no problem. I guess they'd have to put off the sale of Saliba one more year. That's the factor. Now, you know, we all know. There probably has been a meeting where we're going, look, these are the players we believe that they have the potential to go to the next level and we want to sell. So now, as a coach, you got to manage where, okay, I see the young talent, but now who do I want to have on the field right now to get the results? Because let's not forget, this is not MLS Next Pro. This is every game you're going to be in a crisis or you're going to push yourself to say, okay, 
or things are going well. We got the victories. We got the fan base going. We got so those are all aspects that come into decision where the coach goes, I know uh, this player, we want to play him, but right now I may need more experience in the field. And and uh, and we went to get more experience on the field with Ruan, Edwards, and all of them. So it's a big conundrum for Lanco Tua because in the middle, that's probably the part where we're like, who's going to be the consistent duo that's going to be in starting 11? And yeah, I do believe that some of them won't play 34 games. Uh now, is it he's going to change according to when they play away or who they're going to play? Because he has different types of duels. We all, I think, agree that Wanyama and Piet together, that might not happen quite often, if at all. No, no, I, I don't think so. If, the way I've seen, I'm going through reading through the lineups they give in every game. It's been one team has been on the field. Piet has been captain. One team was on, the other team was on the field. Waterman was captain. And not Victor Wanyama. So it tells me Piet has been is keeping that role as captain. And I don't think they're gonna announce a new captaincy. They might just say Waterman has more lead or more bring in more leadership. And maybe if Piet's not on the field, then Waterman becomes that guy that they they assume will be able to dictate the others. But yeah, it'll be curious to see. I see Piet Schwanier started off. Because I yeah. don't know, maybe Saliba got a knock, and that's why he didn't play the last game. I got it. Yeah. But I see right now Piet and Schwanier starting because they've shown when they played even with Wilfred Nasi together that those two have chemistry. Uh, and now is Nathan Saliba. I believe he, he has something else, another ceiling that he can reach, bringing more, uh, driving the ball, maybe even going to score goals. Now is, is he proving that at training? So that Laura Cortoa says, I have no choice to put the kid who's 19 years old ahead of all these guys. Yeah, and, and Waterman... Waterman's going to be on the field a lot. Yes. He's going to be on the field a lot, and you would think he's going to be here for a couple of years. Yeah. You would think. All right, okay. Um, moving on along, uh, a lot of the – I don't know of any expert that has CF Montreal in the playoffs. This nope. is a team that missed uh, the playoffs uh, last Law. year. Frederick Law, ninth. Okay. All right, okay. But the rest uh, is all uh, – I, I understand. He's he's been their play by play man since I can remember. I mean, if there's one person who's going to put them in, it's going to be him. Okay, um, but even at that, he, he thinks they're going what? He's they're going for a play in, or they're 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 just getting oh, in. Play in. I think if I remember the predictions, he put them ninth, so last pl playoff spot. Okay, so um, he's the only one that we know of out of members of the media that is documented that has them in the playoffs. They missed the playoffs last year, missed it on the final day of the season. Um, made the playoffs the year before with Will for Nancy the year before they just missed out when they miss out. They're usually very close. A lot of people seem to believe that this team is a better team this year than last year has more depth. Yes, I'm uh, have a uh, Kokaro, have a Opoku since the start of the season, have a Lasseter since the start of the season, have a Duke since the start of the season, have a Roberto Martinez, uh, have a jo pardon me, have a Joseph Martinez who can um, uh, can either you know come off the bench right now and be a super sub, and when he ends up getting a hundred percent, end up being a starter and probably scoring with regularity the way he did before. It's another year under his belt, more experience for Jules Anthony Vilse, more experience for. Nathan Saliba. Schwanier looks like after a great season last year, he still might be ready to take another step. Uh, Ruan comes in at right wing back. Uh, Edwards comes in at left wing back. There's some depth there. Serrois got an extra year under his belt after standing on his head a year ago. Um, there's a new coach who prone the same system as the coach that used to be here a couple of years ago, who's now the coach. So a lot of people think that this is a better team, but it's got a lot of new players. Yes. And it's going to take a while for chemistry to set in. So knowing everything you know, Patrice Bernier, where are they going to finish? I put them 10th, finishing 10th. I looked at all the teams. I looked at the – because also people look at investment. New York City FC just bought an 18-year-old kid for $8.6 Chicago bought a kid, got a player for $10 million. So people see, oh, they're investing more. So normally more money, higher quality player. That's what people see. I see it as just as you mentioned, several things. For one, let's not forget, new coach. Two, this is not Losada starting with eight starters from the year before. This is Laurent Courtois with Juan, 
Like there, maybe Sosa as a starter, Edwards as a starter, Yankov, Kokaro. So you have around four or five players that weren't starters in your group last year. So it's not the same team. This is not Wilfred Nancy's team. And then Laura Courtois just revamping them from one year of losing their identity. This is a new constructed team that the club acquired some quality players. So on paper, they are very strong. But Courtois has to, as you mentioned, getting that chemistry, connecting to the way he wants to play. From what we saw the Atlanta game, the goalies are going to be a bit more adventurous, taking those risks and willing to take those risks and identifying. So you're back at Wilfred Nancy year one, where the ideas are put in place, but the players are gelling. And even, I wouldn't say Wilfred Nancy year one, because Wilfred Nancy was in the staff in 2020. So most of the players that were there knew him. The ideas were a bit similar to Thierry Henry. Now, Laura Courtois coming in, new faces. And then after that, you have to look at it. You're starting six games on the road. I now, was just looking at the schedule. I was just looking at that. That's 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 the thing that, see, if they didn't start with six games on the road, Pat, and they would play would road, different. home, road, home, road, home, their place in the standings could be different. Yeah, because remember last year, seven games, one win. What was the one win? At home. The other seven, six games away, they were losses. So Versus now Philly, and by the way, they were losing 2-1 in stoppage time. Remember that? Yeah. They came back 3-2, 95th minute, uh, Kyoto and, uh, and 04. Yeah. I think, uh, so you're starting six games on the road. It's like you're starting where you hopefully they get the results because, hey, they're going to Orlando, Dallas, Miami. Then you go D.C., Chicago, and Seattle. So four, four of those six places are very hard for any team in the league to go and win points. And then after that, you come back home and you're going to play Columbus, Miami, Cincinnati. So that's not easy in terms of collecting points. And last year, they did a great job having the second best wins total in uh, Montreal history at home. Ten. The most has been 11. Can they repeat the home so home uh, uh, home games winning, and then most likely they're probably going to get more wins on the road. So I was looking at they might get 43 to 44 points better than last year, but will that be enough to be in the ninth place? I say 10th because New York City is, is better, New York Red Bulls is better, and then Miami, who finished below them, is right now probably going to finish 6th or 7th because on paper they're a much better team. Then the time this team gels... I don't know if uh, with the six games on the road, that's what really, I can't say bothers me, tells me that that's a difficult mountain to, 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 to climb back from. Hopefully they get a win or two there and get more points than last year so that they're not in the doghouse too early because you want to be in that conversation of the playoffs right from the bat so that you're not always looking how many points do we need to go into the playoffs. You want really to be in that conversation. But I put them 10th because there's so many things that are constructed this year. And uh, I'm I'm optimistic of what Laura Couture can do. But I mean, there's a lot of pieces that need to gel. And then you need to get the results. Um, what can you tell us about the MLS referees? Uh, Pro will lock out the MLS officials after the PRSA membership voted to reject their leadership's tentative agreement over a new CBA via a 95.8% no. That means, Tom Bogart tells us, of The Athletic, the 2024 MLS season will almost definitely start with replacement referees. Um, surely uh, this is uh, not music to Don Garber's ears. No. In a league where you see Lionel Messi effect, more teams, this is probably the transfer window in 2024 where the most money has been spent yet. We can't find an agreement with the pro referees. And let's be honest, everybody complains about the MLS referees. Now you're going to get referees from college, from inferior leagues. So, And are they going to be ready to come into a league that has taken a step in the last few years in terms of the speed of play, uh, the intensity, the identity of styles of play? So hopefully they find an agreement because I don't think it's, it's not good for the image of the league. And I don't think it's good for the quality of the league, first and foremost. You spend on the players, you spend on the coaches, and you're going to have to spend on the referees if you want to go what you say, which is being a top-tier league in the world. 
So you need to get those referees back on the field and uh, and compensate them uh, properly as you as the rest of the league is doing for the rest of the franchises, the players, the coaches, uh, and everything that goes uh, around MLS these days. So hopefully, I think Saturday they'll be replacing refs, but hopefully they find an agreement faster and quicker. Pat, uh, James Sharman um, in the Toronto Star uh, talked about somebody that you know well who apparently has interest in being coach of the Canadians men's national team. We know that Mauro Biello is the coach for now. Uh, after John Herdman left, he took over on an interim basis. Unfortunately, he didn't get the result in his last game versus Jamaica. Uh, he's been given the vote of confidence to try and lead them for their next game <clears throat> uh, next month. Uh, but after that, all bets are off and we're going to see. But there's whispers that some names are starting to come out. There are some who have shown interest. There are some that appear to be interesting. And uh, look, we know it's the biggest tournament our country has ever had. Um coming in just over two years from now. So the one guy you know well, who is James uh, Sharman talking about? Let's bring him up. Thierry Henry. His managerial experience. Arsenal Youth, 2015 to 2016. Belgium National Team as an assistant, 2016 and 2018, 2019 and 2021 coaching the youth, uh, Monaco, 2018 to 2019, Montreal Impact, 2019 to 2021, currently the manager for France's U21 team. This is one candidate. We'll get to the others. Pat, your thoughts on Thierry Henry as a possible manager for the Canadians men's national team. Is it possible? I think yes. When I saw it, I said, wait, he's coaching the U21 team going to the Olympics. So he wouldn't be coming right now. You're going to, if you qualify in March, you will be going to Copa America. You want your coach in place quicker, sooner than later. So even if there's, I've heard that actually there is interest, but everybody would say, and the next candidate I think is uh, Hervé Renard, it would be for after the Olympics. But I think you're losing time with not confirming the coach. Either Mauro Biello sticks on as he qualifies the team for Copa America or you announce the coach so that if you make it to Copa America, he has a camp, he can prepare the team and going already to a prestigious tournament facing, I think there'll be in a group uh, in Argentina if they uh, qualify. So Thierry Henry, I saw it, I go like, Okay, I understand Terry wants to coach a, a first team, but he's coaching the under-21 national team. And if he does well at the Olympics, most likely other opportunities will arise. So uh, I I know that... He, he, does, he does have World Cup experience. I, yes, you know, exactly. I know assisted that. to Roberto Martinez, of course, of Belgium at the World Cup. He does have it. The one thing I found about Thierry, and Pat, I know you're close to him, and I could be wrong. It's, it's my interpretation from the outside. I find that Thierry never fully transitioned from player to coach. I felt that he coached with the mentality of a player a lot. We saw images in the past when he was here of getting very upset when players weren't doing things that for him would be elementary, but for them would probably be difficult. But for him, he could do it with his eyes closed. All right? And so... That's my thought, that he was he was still in a player's mind. Um, clearly, he's a better coach today, you would think, than he was back then because every day you learn, you get better. There's practice on the field. He's with Francis U21. The one thing I would like is I don't think any player on that team would be above the team or would be like, I've arrived and I'm running the show here with Soccer Canada. The way there have been players who have been labeled as prima donnas in the last year, I don't think they would be able to be with Thierry Henry because I don't think he would be impressed 
with any of their careers when they compare it to his, as yeah. good as some of them are. Yeah, that would be good. Definitely. If you come with, if Thierry comes, and first and foremost, I always think of, because people forget, but before COVID hit, the team was doing well. And the players were, were really buying into what Thierry Henry brought from preseason. That's the first part. I always curious, like if COVID didn't happen, what, how the scene? Because I, I saw uh, Thierry went, went after COVID and you saw it affected him not being close to his family. And then, and then the, the past of the player would come in also to irritate him at certain moments. And then the second part is I believe that 2020 year changed him. I believe he's, he's a different approach. Everybody has seen his interviews. Now you see it, you see him being more vulnerable saying this, what was happening with me being that player, being the coach, being these, uh, now going back to the players, definitely when you bring Thierry Henry, if you were to Kenya national team for one, he's got the experience. As you mentioned, he's been at the world cup, those players, Definitely, they have no choice they could respect because he's done it all. And then the second thing is Canada soccer, who is right now in a turmoil that we've never seen before. And I've been part of Canada soccer where sometimes we're like, man, where are we going with this uh, camps, stuff like that. And now you're just looking at everybody's leaving. The board members are leaving. Your coach has left. Uh, now he would bring another profile to you. Definitely on the aspect of marketing, you know, Thierry Henry coming to Canada soccer you're starting to sell the world about your product. So as he comes out of the technical part, there's also aspect that the eyeballs would be on Canada a lot more knowing that Thierry Henry is your coach. And you know, if he's going to be the coach, he's, you know that if he's going to be the coach, he's going to reach out to you. I don't know. Maybe like last gonna, time, because when he came to Montreal, uh, all I know you're is gonna like, be on the staff, I'm, Pat. I'm coming into town. So who knows? Pat, you're going to be on the staff. So you know what? I, I'm going to suck up to you like you cannot believe <laughs> over the next month or so. Uh, you know what? Give me your address. I'm sending flowers to the missus. I'm, I'm doing your groceries. I'm doing everything. All right. Okay. Uh, well, we know that coaches like to surround themselves with people that they know and that they trust and that they believe will be loyal to them. And we also know Thierry Henry was very fond of you, Pat. Uh, he, he said once upon a time that, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe he talked about just how very good of a player he thought that you were. Uh, and uh, and uh, he really appreciated you as a player and a person. All right, you mentioned the name, Hervé Renard. Let's bring him up. Hervé Renard. That's a very extensive managerial career. Um, what's impressive is you're going to notice there's a lot of national teams there. Mm. Zambia national team. Angola national team. Ivory Coast. Morocco, Saudi Arabia, currently coaching France's women's team. But at last World Cup, once again, coached Saudi Arabia and not only coached them in the opening match for his team, they beat Lionel Messi's Argentina, yeah, we which is the that. only loss that Argentina had at the World Cup because, of course, they went on to win the World Cup. Here's a guy, Pat. His CV is impressive. He's got a ton of experience. He's got a ton of experience with national teams. Um, he's obviously, he can address the nation in English and in French. He has a ton of personality. He's got a ton of fire. You would think that he would be running the show as well, and it wouldn't be a player. Uh, he's, got, he, 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 he's got an iron fist. But at the same time, you know, the first two candidates that we talked about, Thierry Henry, Hervé Renard. The Federation is going to need at least, and I don't know. I haven't talked to either of them, so I don't know. But can you get either of these guys signed for less than, at the very, 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 very least, 1.5? Uh, from what I know, Hervé Renard was, has been approached, but he's way too costly. So... Uh, and it would be for after the Olympics. And I believe Cote d'Ivoire just tried to get him, but France said no. So yeah, uh, they blocked. I, I would, I would, I would think he's probably asking, boom, you know, saying uh, between two and two and a half. 
but I don't know how much he would want the job or not want the job. But, uh, you know, I gave 1.5 as the bare minimum, but yeah. I would imagine that any of these coaches are asking for at least two, at uh, least two million. In Thierry's, in Thierry's uh, possibility, I think he would be more interested in the opportunity than the amount of money that, that uh, like, I think he would be willing to come for a reduced salary for the opportunity to coach because he, he just loves coaching and he wants to get that head coaching job. Uh, he is friends under 21, but I think he's, he wants to coach. If anybody see, follows him, CBS sports, you, you hear him. He's always like, I just love the game. I, I'm passionate. Yeah, if I'm correct. He came to Montreal for, for less than what his value is in the world. If you could say, yeah, and there's a okay. third name that I've, There's a third name, Pat, that I've heard, and then we'll end it with this. I don't know if you've heard the same name. Let's bring him up. I hope it's not the Real Madrid coach. Ah, okay. Paul Clement. Paul Clement um, is a former assistant to Carlo Ancelotti with uh, Real Madrid, with Chelsea. Uh, you have um, Bayern on his CV. Uh, PSG um, spent a lot of time with Ancelotti. They worked together for seven years. Also coached the youth, you know, Fulham U18s, Chelsea U16, Chelsea U18. Um, most recently with Everton, has coached Swansea City, Reading, Sacre Bruges. Um, It's it's a pretty impressive CV. He's gone on record as saying, and I read this somewhere, that he'd love to have the opportunity, if it's there, to coach a national team. There's an opportunity there, possibly, with Canada. Um, a lesser profile name than Thierry Henry and Hervé Renard. But... Um, When you coach with Ancelotti for seven years, I would imagine you picked up a thing or two along the way. Yeah, I think you mentioned that the CV is important. Uh, I, I won't say that the players at first and foremost are like, they just want to know who would who will be the coach. But at the end of the day, when they you hear like, oh, where he where's he been? Who's he worked with? Ah, okay. He's because let's not forget Canada is playing with Alfonso Davies, who is at Bayern Munich. Jonathan David is at Lille. Steven is Bayern Munich is for now. Porto. By, now. Bayern now. Bayer, Bayer Munich for Bayern Munich for now. You're going to wait Real Madrid and, from what the well, rumors are saying. So you can bet the house. He's going to Real Madrid. So, bet the house. So now also the profiling of coaches like okay, do they deal with these types of egos and personalities because people may say yeah, Alfonso, yes. At the end of the day, I know Alfonso. I knew him at 17, but now he's now Alfonso Davies a world worldwide uh, popular player and uh, and star and so now you're working with somebody who has a different dimension and, uh, and yeah. sometimes you need the coaches that are saying hey how to approach these types of players and i'm not saying i know Mauro Biello is very uh, good at relations with the players i'm just saying if a coach who's coming in what players we would be uh, thinking of of somebody from a, a name coming out like so Different CV and hey, hey. probably costing less. That's for sure, uh, because Canada soccer situation is you can't. They cannot go in out and spend so uh, uh, a lot. That's where every Renard, I can say, yeah. couldn't be taken because he costs too much. So, yeah. And listen, of course, uh, we all wish Mauro well. Uh, the job is his for now. That goes without saying that we want to see him succeed. But uh, here we are. We're in the news and we're tackling names that are out there, uh, names that have been whispered, names that have shown interest. Um, and so we'll see what happens, but, uh, Morrow's got a real nice opportunity ahead of him and we'll see what happens there. Pat season opens for the MLS and for CF Montreal on Saturday versus Orlando city. And it just seemed like last season ended yesterday, but it couldn't come fast enough. We'll talk to you again one week from today when Ali Gerba will join us with a microphone. A brand new mic <laughs> and a tripod. <laughs> good stuff. Good stuff. Yeah. And a light. <laughs>
That's on me, Ali. You better be worth it. Until then, we'll talk to you again. I'll be back, by the way, in a couple of days with Nilton George. He'll join me. We'll do it on Thursday. Same time, same place at 1 p.m., the Sick Podcast, CF Montreal Talk. Subscribe to our Twitter channel, at SickPod, CFMTL, and our Instagram, at SickPod, CFMTL, the same thing. And most importantly, subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's absolutely free. Merci beaucoup, Pat. We'll talk to you again next week. Merci beaucoup. Merci à tout le monde. Thank you. I'm Marinero. Have a great day. Cheers. And that's a wrap. Hope you don't miss us too much until next time. Follow the Sick Podcast, CF Montreal Talk on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Google Play, and Apple Podcasts.